So I have, for the most part of my life, had experiences with the paranormal, or spirits if you will. I've had several things happen to me as I've grown up, or even as an adult, and my own children have experienced things, but one instance was very, very scary. At the time, I was a young mother, early twenties, living alone with my three children. They were six, five, and three, my daughter being the youngest, and my two boys were six and five. We were all asleep, but something I'm still unclear of today woke up my eldest son. What I heard him say in a very chilling and low voice was, Mommy, Mommy. I awoke and sat up to look at him. He was sleeping on a mattress on the floor with his brother and sister. I asked him what was wrong. He said, Mommy, there's a scary lady standing next to you, just looking at you, which in turn made me frantically search around the room. I kind of yelled out, What? What lady? I don't see anything. My daughter had woken up by then. She said nothing, but pointed in the direction my son was looking. I started to feel every hair on my body stand up at this moment, and then he said something I'll never forget. This scary lady comes here almost every night and stands in front of our beds and just stares and smiles at us while we sleep. She even told me she wants to take me home with her. I was paralyzed with fear and my light switch was all the way across the room, so I didn't want to move. I tried to focus as I looked around the room to attempt to see what he was talking about. My middle child then wakes up when my daughter started to cry and says, Who are you? I then really panicked, but still felt frozen with fear trying to see what all three of my children were seeing. My oldest then darted for the light switch, while the other two just kept screaming mommy. When the light switched on, they all continued to cry, and when they started to calm down, they said the scary lady was gone. They said she was wearing a very long white dress. It was old and tattered. Her face was scratched up, and she had long curly blonde hair and dark, almost black eyes. I asked why they had started screaming. They said she started to walk towards them with a slight grin and terrifying stare. She said she was taking them home. At that moment, I didn't want to turn off the lights, as all three of them proceeded to explain to me what this lady was doing. Apparently, I was a threat to her, and had in her mind taken her children, and she was angry with me for that, and wished me to die. I don't know if she thought she was alive or what, but my children saw her numerous times, always just standing next to my bed, looking at me with hate and anger. I couldn't sleep with the lights off for a while after this first occurrence. Needless to say, I tried to deal with this unsettling experience for as long as I could, and eventually we moved. I'm happy to say she did not follow us, but my children still can't sleep unless there's a light on, and they all said the scary lady will forever haunt them. I hope that's not true. Ghosts are very real, and even though we may not be able to see them, they exist. I'm forever changed because of this experience. I live in dorms on campus at my college. I was back a week early during winter break for Greek recruitment, basically interviewing with and visiting different sororities all week. And the only other people on campus were other girls rushing and a few workers at the front desk. They didn't have the cleaning company, dining hall staff, or even our RAs around at all. And my entire floor, since it is mostly made up of exchange students from China, was empty. I was the only one, and one of the few in the entire tower. There are four dorm towers, twelve floors each. To get up to the dorm this week, you had to check in with the front desk to get your key reactivated, and every time you wanted to go up, they would swipe to give you permission to go past the front desk. You then had to swipe to unlock the doors to the hallway containing the elevators, again to be able to press a button, and once more to actually get into the dorm. If you didn't have a key coded to a specific tower or room, you couldn't get into it. Now I was in my room the second night of the week, settled back in and sitting on my futon, my back against one of the armrests and facing the door. The rooms are long rectangles with a window at one end and a door at the other. My bed was lofted above me, 
and I have a blanket hanging down from there behind my head, so you essentially couldn't see me from the doorway. I was laying there with my headphones in, jumping through YouTube videos, when I heard the door open. Not only is there a distinct sound of the keycard activating, like a hotel door, I also still have Christmas ornaments hanging from the ceiling. I heard the door open, and knew it opened all the way, because it hit an ornament, and it fell off its hook. I froze in fear. I knew my roommate wasn't back, and neither was my RA, and those were the only two people who would have access to my room. My first thought was that whoever it was would realize their mistake and quickly back out, kinda like opening an occupied bathroom stall. But as I froze, barely breathing, I heard them take two steps forward and even bump my suitcase, which was taking up much of the doorway. I adjusted slightly, and my futon squeaked. Instantly, I heard the footsteps retreat, the door close, and the person move away down the hall. I was stuck where I was for maybe an hour, until I could finally muster up the courage to turn around. On the floor was the broken ornament and my suitcase sitting slightly ajar. I texted my roommate and RA, practically begging them to tell me they were back. But my roommate was still in London, and my RA confirmed my fear. Not only was she not back, but she said she had no idea who would be able to get into my room. Even if the cleaning people or the maintenance guys were back, they don't have permission to go into dorms, nor any way to get in. She assured me she would let the front desk know, and said maybe it was a Springs admission student who probably got coded the wrong key. I accepted that as an answer. They were confused, heard me move, and realized they got the wrong room. It wouldn't happen again if that was it, but I had a hard time sleeping that night. I even felt terrified to turn around and look at the door when I woke up the next morning. But then night returned, and I, unable to sleep and very scared, was once again up late browsing Reddit. This time I had my phone close to me, and had taped a piece of string over the door, since I didn't have the ornament alarm hanging anymore, and needed to validate I wasn't going crazy. Once again at 3am, I heard heavy footsteps outside my door the distinct use of the keycard, and the door open up. I stayed frozen, and realized I could see their silhouette in the microwave's door. They stayed in the doorway, and nearly filled up the whole thing, the light from the hallway streaming around them into my dark room. I stayed still, convinced they meant malice, and that last night wasn't a mistake. But if they wanted me asleep, they were in for a surprise. I hit play on a video I had queued up, and as soon as the ad started, the figure left and the door closed behind them. When I finally looked, the string was broken. I told my RA and roommate about this, as well as the front desk the next morning. All of them confirmed not only that no one else had a registered key for my floor in my tower, but even those that did weren't back yet, whether it was other students or employees. I didn't sleep the rest of the week and kept my suitcase and chair in front of the door but it never happened again. But even now, months later, that little 9 by 20 room is terrifying when I am alone at night, since whoever comes through that door is only a few steps away from my bed and blocks the only way out. So dorm room creeper, let's not meet for the third time. I can say first thing that I don't believe in the supernatural, and I don't claim that my experience is such, but I can't explain what I saw exactly, and I can't keep this to myself anymore. I used to love going camping at a youth leadership camp, deep in the northern lakes of the Canadian wilderness. I was a counselor for the spring and summer program, and it's my job to organize the wilderness excursions, or out trips as we called them. Basically, I guide the group of kids through a series of campsites. I also assist in the daily activities and games the camp puts on. This camp is an hour north of the closest town, and truly is the Canadian deep wilderness. Dense, dark forest dripping with fog extends for hundreds of miles, the majority of which is unsoiled by man. The nights there are serene, cool, and breathtakingly quiet, 
except for the gentle sigh of the trees as they sway in the night breeze. My experience, context aside, happened to me during the weeks prior to opening the camp for the summer. I had finished my day's work of preparing the tandem canoes by inspecting their integrity, checking inventory of life vests, paddles, and kayaks, as well as other things we need to do before guests arrive. I sleep out in the Aspen cabins, which are the group of cabins where senior campers sleep during the season, and they're furthest from the recreation room and mess hall. It was around 9.30 or so at night, right after the sun had dipped under the horizon. My fellow counselors, who were all women, slept in a nearby cabin, so it was just me in my own space. That was alright with me, as I do enjoy my own personal space and always have. I've always found a grand sense of place within nature when being by myself. There's something about the wild that always makes me feel a connection to the earth, but there's something about the wilderness that has always been creepy as well. I often thought about the old settlers and first inhabitants living in these woods before electricity and good shelter and marveled at their bravery. Hearing the trees sway and sigh as the night breathes across the land and seeing nothing but darkness and moonlight is almost a spiritual experience. You can really appreciate where these legends of Bigfoot, the Wendigo and clawed and toothed monsters came from. Your eyes play tricks on you out here. In fact, I enjoy spooking my group of campers as we sit around a fire in the middle of the woods during our trips. I was lying in bed when I heard the bathroom door slam shut. I jumped. I immediately tiptoed to the door and pulled it open and felt a rush of cool May air. I must have left a window open and the wind had pulled it shut. I remember being relieved when I opened the door to find my hypothesis to be correct, even though I knew it was. I remember this clearly because a few seconds after I entered the washroom, I saw something I'll never forget. After I closed the window, I heard the mirror crack behind me. Spinning around, I stood pressed against the corner of the wall in the window, looking at it. It had cracked diagonally right down the middle. The night was chilly, but chilly enough to crack a mirror? I don't know. My heart was pounding in my chest the dim bathroom light casting shadows across the room. At some point, an insidious sense of dread began to creep up my spine like a centipede. Something was wrong. The whole energy in the space was off. I wanted to go back to my bed where I could lock the door and feel more comfortable. I wish I had just done that and not turned to the window, but I did. I felt I had to confront this feeling because I'd never felt such a primal sense of fear before. I turned to the window and looked, really looked out into the night, and I swear to God, the longer I looked, the more I saw it. Big, wet eyes half hidden in darkness, but looking at me. A vast silhouette of hair and broad shoulders. It must have reached the bottom of the fucking trees. Most of its massive features were shrouded in foliage and bark. I stood transfixed. It was waiting, or simply observing. But those eyes. I can't tell you how I got through that night, for it was a blur to me. I knew I couldn't work there any longer, though. I told them that I saw a brown bear in a tree, and that it was a mother protecting her cubs, and how I would advise against taking kids out there until they moved on. There were no official reports of anything happening at the camp after I left, and I still check their website. I'm getting chills up my spine as I write this in my apartment because I have no explanation for what I saw that night. It was too big to be a bear. Its eyes were too wide, too wet. I hope I imagined it, but you never know. The wilderness is a big place. My great-grandmother took her last breath in July of 1997. We had moved in with her a few years prior to take care of her at the end of her life. We didn't live in a haunted house in the woods. It was a row home in northeast Philly. I didn't yet understand what it meant to lose a family member. I studied my mom's reactions in the moments right after it happened. She was focused on how everyone else was reacting and tending to them. 
I tried to stay out of her way as she ran back and forth by sitting halfway up the stairs to the second floor. I watched for hours as people came in and out of the house, until it was at capacity. Her hospital bed lay under me next to the stairs, off to the side of the living room, where a few family members and neighbors stood talking to each other. The sun went down, and the lights started coming on in the house. It was a red color that shone through the old lampshades. I had seen just about everyone walk in, except for an old man in a black outfit and a white collar. He was standing over my grandmother's body with his hand over her face, gently placing something in her mouth. It was a black stone, so deep and dark I will remember as if it were burned into my brain. There was no light in the stone, no color whatsoever. The man placed the stone in her mouth and gently closed it with the same hand. He said some words I could not hear and glanced up the stairway where I had been sitting. I looked away, out of respect and feeling somewhat awkward about what I had just seen. I slumped down the stairs on my butt slowly and went to the kitchen to find my father. He had been sitting at the kitchen table, listening to a conversation between old relatives reminiscing about how grandmom was a free spirit who loved to dance. I tried talking to him, but the room was filled with conversations, so we went out back. He lit a cigarette and asked if I was okay. I climbed the cellar door we had out back and poked my head into the kitchen window to see if the man with the black stone was still in the house. I didn't see him. I asked my dad what the ceremony could have been about, placing a black stone in grandmom's mouth. What are you talking about? He said to me. I described again what I saw, and he told me there was no priest at the house, and I just let it go. The moment never left me though. I asked my mom later about it, and she also told me there was no priest at the house. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandmother about it years later, great-grandmom's daughter. She says I saw an angel, but I do not believe in these things. I asked both parents even more recently, and they remember me being concerned about it, but still do not recall anything. It happened. I remember feeling that moment. I have found stories of zombie prevention and similarly ridiculous things related to placing stones in the mouth of the dead, but have not found the black stone. Did I peek behind the fabric? My dad used to tell me I was born with a veil over my face, said it meant I could see what others couldn't. Am I crazy? Is merely being capable of asking that question evidence enough that I'm not? What I really want to know is, if I see the man with the stone again, will it be for me? I live in the Pacific Northwest. After I graduated high school in 2005, I took a motorcycle trip with my dad. We did some sightseeing, camped outside in Montana, and were just free spirits for a week. It was great. We were on the home stretch, somewhere in the Washington Mountains. We were not on the highway, since we wanted to take the scenic routes. We decided to stop at a small campsite off the road. I don't recall if there were any official signs up, but there was a restroom. Just a cement block wall with a trough and no ceiling, and a few Native Americans who were asking for donations to keep the campgrounds clean and in working order. Judging by the state of the campgrounds, they didn't get much. We were sore and our muscles needed stretching, so we decided to walk a bit. There was a thin strip of grassy field on the other side of the road that had some cows grazing in it and the edge of the woods was across that field. We decided to take a walk and enjoy nature for a bit, since it was a particularly beautiful area. The trees were dense, and the moss hanging from them made it seem almost like walking through a fairy tale, magical and serene. There were some trails, but they weren't man-made, probably elk trails. They began to get tougher, climbing over some fallen trees and navigating sinkholes and stuff like that. We decided it might be a good time to turn around, since we had gone in quite a ways. That's when I spotted it, something that didn't belong in a forest at all. It was a car, not a modern car. This had to have been from the 1930s. We could see it ahead, off the trail, and in a small clearing, 
we had to get a better look. My dad and I are really into the old car scene, car shows and hot rods. This was too cool to pass up. So we waded through the brush, ferns and bushes to get a closer look. We were excited and talking to each other about the car. How did it get here, so far away from the road? When it was parked here, maybe there weren't as many trees, or maybe it had followed a logging road or trail and got stuck, but that must have been a long ass time ago. It had to have been sitting here since Prohibition. At this point, we were getting really close. Our conversation had distracted us until now. But when we stopped and took a look at the car, we knew something wasn't right. The car wasn't just a rusted derelict sitting in the woods. We could see that the doors had been pried off. They were laying in the dirt. The interior had been completely torn out, and inside was a nest. I'm not talking about a bird's nest. This was a nest for something big. Really big. There were branches that were woven together, and some of them were thicker than my forearm. They were all woven in the inside of the car, with one side as the entrance point. The branches seemed to be caked from the inside with mud to make some sort of plaster walls, and there was hair everywhere, on the floor, within the branches, and on the ground near the entrance. Then the smell hit us. It may not have been mud at all. It was feces. It had to be. And it was awful. A thick and heavy smell. Imagine being sprayed by a skunk, but instead of the famous skunk smell, it was something different. Musky and acrid. Absolutely nasty. At this point, we were getting scared. I asked my dad if he thought a bear did it. No, definitely not and bears don't have the dexterity to create a nest. Not like that. But something made this car its home. And that's when we heard it. The silence. There was no bird. No insect. Not a living creature making a single sound. It was so quiet, I found myself holding my breath. I turned to my dad and said maybe we should go. So we turned in the direction of the trail and started heading back. We didn't make it more than two steps when something snapped a branch behind us. We froze. The crack of this branch was like a gunshot. Then another snap. And another. And it wasn't small branches. Not the quick snap of a branch under our feet. This sounded like the splintering of a log. A thick, heavy branch. I don't remember who started running first, but we broke into a full sprint. And so did the thing behind us. We were racing between trees, dodging saplings and jumping over fallen logs. Whatever was behind us did not bother moving obstacles. It smashed through them. Wood was being splintered behind us. I could see the tops of the thin saplings fall in my peripheral vision and spring halfway back up when it passed them. It was just knocking everything over. I've never been so terrified. We finally burst out of the woods and into the small strip of fields separating us from the campground. I remember looking sideways at my dad and seeing how red his face was. I could see the veins popping out of his forehead. He was not a fit man, but there was nothing that would have stopped him. Usain Bolt would have had a run for his money. Now if having some sort of monster chasing us wasn't bad enough, as we ran through the field, we noticed a huge bull among the cows. This bull came running straight at us. I'm thinking to myself, great, I get killed by a bull, or I get killed by whatever this thing is behind me. Either way, I'm dead. But the bull makes a detour, and decides whatever is chasing us is a bigger threat, and runs straight for it. I believe that bull saved our lives. We get to the other side of the field, and make it partway up the slight hill to the campground. I feel like I can finally afford to look behind me. There's nothing. The bull is fixated at something in the trees, but I can't see it. Whatever it was, the bull stopped it from following us across the field. My dad and I collapsed and laid there for several long minutes, gasping for breath. My lips and nose were tingly and numb, and my side felt like I had been stabbed. It was a long time before we finally got up. The natives at the campground saw us run out of the woods and saw the bull run at the thing chasing us. They said it was Sasquatch. We listened to them tell us about the Sasquatch. They lived in the mountains, 
and we're always very careful around humans. Sometimes they scare us away if we get too close, but they never harm humans. But sometimes the winters are harsh, and it snows heavily in the mountains and it's hard to find food. Some Sasquatch, in desperation, will kill their own kind and eat them to not starve. The ones who do this become feral, sick, and cursed. They grow thin, lose their hair, and become sickly, yet are still incredibly fast and powerful. They believe that's what chased us. We left the campground in a quiet and serious mood. No more sightseeing, and no more lazy rest stops. We made the eight-hour drive back home and slept. We talked about the encounter with family and friends, but nobody believed us. Years later, we decided to go back and try to find the car, so we could take some pictures to prove it. The road and the campground had been wiped out during a mudslide. We weren't even able to get within 10 miles of it. I don't know if the car is buried too, but I sure hope so. I hope it's all buried. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to tell your story, or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the description. Come follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Cory Rhino. Be good to animals, even people, see ya. Now let's get down to business here. I'm doing the Carolina Reaper Challenge. So let's give it a shot. Alright, here we go. <clears throat> Tingly. Yeah, now it's coming. Something tells me this is going to be even worse later. Seven hours later. Oh man, this is not going to be good. Mommy! Come on, ice cream. Nice to that bird. Nice. <laughs> Ripley's so mad because there's two crows. There's two ravens right outside on the fence. <laughs> She's so fucking mad. You be nice to those birds. <laughs> they want daddy to give them some food. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to be nice to them? <laughs> oh, shit. Hey! <laughs> you don't want me to be nice to them? I give you fucking food. I shouldn't give those birds any food. Okay, birds, you want some food? <laughs> Ripley, I give them fucking cat food. And you fucking pieces of steak and shit. I'm, I'm gonna be nice to the birds. Hey, be careful. Be careful. All right. 